Hey everybody, so welcome to another edition of the Knowledge Graph Technology Showcase Summer Edition. So today we are going to be looking at a new company that is creating visualizations for the tool that Graken created. They have now gone through some rebranding, so they are now called Vatical Type DB. So if you're interested in that full review, check it out up here. But today we are going to be looking at Node Lab that is creating more visualizations for a customized analytic perspective of what TypeDB is doing today. So if this sounds interesting to you, keep on watching. So John, first off, why don't you introduce yourself and introduce to us what is it that we're going to be seeing today? Yeah, so uh, thank you for having me here. And I'm, so I'm John Thompson. I live in Copenhagen in Denmark, a nice little part of the world. And I uh, have been working as a data scientist. Uh, my background is in uh, bioinformatics. Hmm. I saw that there was a need for a visualizer and uh, Graken or TypeDB at the time had a, and still has a native visualizer called the Workbase. Mm -hmm. uh, that's very useful. Uh, it just comes with some limitations, right? Um, it doesn't, it, it, there are some things that you can't do, like you can't have icons, for instance, mm -hmm. right? And I think there's a lot of people who want those, but mm -hmm. there's also more, more important things, such as when you are, when you have some huge database, you probably want to expand some of the, you know, look at the local neighborhood around mm -hmm. some notes. And that can be very hard to do in the work base alone because it'll just kind of give you everything and it'll crowd up your screen. The the cool thing that you you are alluding to but aren't saying explicitly, but I want to say it explicitly, is that because Type DB is very much a community centered um, kind of of application. They really encourage people to build off of it and do more with it and expand it. And I think that's exactly what you're saying is you saw a need for something and you knew that the community was also looking at that. And so you just did it, right? And and I think that's a, a beautiful thing because not all the uh, databases out there, especially in the graph community, uh, allow that sort of thing. So it's pretty cool you're doing it. Yeah, and I think the type DB, the Vatical team spend uh, an inordinate amount of time interacting and building <laughs> the community compared yeah. to the size. They're a they're, they're medium sized team, but they invest a lot in that. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I, I see that all the time. So in the nature of uh, early stage projects, this is, we're currently called Node Lab. Mm -hmm. and, uh, that is uh, sort of already a rebrand, but apparently that's what all the all the good companies do. That so that's all what that's what the cool kids do nowadays. <laughs> <laughs> um, you did say that this is you know a work in progress, and we definitely will circle back and see the finished product um, in another video. I'd love to do a follow up, a before and after. That's right, and I'll be talking a bit about the the uh, timeline going forward also. Great. Great. So Node Lab, um, some perhaps just a, a quick word on the motivation is also that in addition to just having a tool that's widely available, I specifically would like a tool that, uh, as I mentioned, investigative journalists and life scientists who mm -hmm. are some of the main potential users for a network analysis tool. I really think it's exciting to make a tool available for them that is usable and powerful. And I think there's a real there's a real gap in that space for a sort of general purpose power Absolutely. tool. Absolutely. In in line with that, I, I just want to show you the uh, data set that. Um, yeah, great. So the data set that we are uh, just going to use as the main example here is the International uh, Consortium of Investigative Journalists, they have this Paradise Papers data set. Mm -hmm. So this mm -hmm. is, this is, you know, this is, uh, this is interesting for investigative journalists. This is a, yeah. a lot of corporate uh, entities, uh, almost a million in this data set and yeah. all kinds of relations between them, between the officers of those corporates and uh, the intermediaries. So this, this gives you, a, this is a pretty cool data set and it's also, Mm -hmm. And it's also a good uh, performance wise, it's kind of a good test bed because it, you know, it's, yeah. it, it, it does something that you can run tests on, but it's still it's still pretty big. So, yeah. And, and I want to mention um, the video that uh, I did for the honest review for Neo4j 
also yeah. uses this exact same data set in the video. So this yeah. will be really interesting to see um, a comparison between the two. It's not necessarily one is better than the other. Neo is a different type of database than yeah. uh, what type DB is. So I'll, I'll state that first, but I think it will be very interesting to see how they go um, together after this. Yeah, yeah. So, but one of the main ways that uh, Graken and or TypeDB now is is made is and which diff, makes it differ from quite a lot of other tools is the the way you explicitly define the schema as part yeah. of how you work with it. So, mm -hmm. and that is part of what we do. So I'm in this app as well. You'll be able to uh, you'll be able to explore and, and and also define your schema as you go. Nice. So, and I think that's again that's one thing that's currently missing um, and in any sort of non-code environment. And it there are different people working on it. And it's just something that you know it's it's very nice when a lot of people can easily help build their schemas because that's one of the real strengths of TypeDB is that it's fairly straightforward. That the whole yeah. ontology building is like an order of magnitude less difficult than say with OWL or, or comparable. Yeah. Um, I think that that really helps. And then the no code, thank you for that. Because so often I think that that's one of the biggest hurdles to getting into Graph at all is, okay, you've got people that really understand the the information and the and the structure of the data, but they don't know Graph very well. So, you know, making that transition a little easier is fabulous. That's great. And, and I think one of the just practical examples, even for the people who know how to code, is that you when you're working with a big schema or a big database mm -hmm. you can't possibly remember all the structure or the types yeah, yeah. so yeah. <laughs> you need a tool that kind of helps you <laughs> to do that good so, point good point i'm just going to show you a short video that just shows how you can filter your schema types mm -hmm. and so this is an existing database this is the icij papers database and we're just looking at the schema view now so you have this menu that you have this hierarchical representation of the schema. Mm -hmm. Just kind of select from this drop down menu what types you want. So yeah. I can just pause this maybe and take it back. Here you see in this view, let's, yeah, here we have the entities that are present mm -hmm. in the schema. And that is just, you can also, of course, see the relations. Yeah. And uh, we'll add the relations. Oh, that became very complicated all of a sudden. I can see what you mean about the icons, though. I mean, I know that looking at the other, um, I think there's there's only two others that I know that use icon sort of nodes. But mm. now that I'm seeing it in practice with what you're showing, I can see how valuable that is. Because, you know, the um, the hairball look, which is what this is, um, oftentimes it's it's where your eye is drawing is kind of like what you're you're wanting to use this kind of visual for and having that additional visual cue of an icon is really helpful. Right, exactly. And and I think, yeah, this that's a huge focus here is just reduce the complexity of using yeah. it. And and actually on on that, uh, there is so one thing that is still very much work in progress, but is I think a really core thing in any visualization app is can you what sort of options are there apart from the hairball way of looking at it hairball yeah so here we have a manageable hairball right but it's still a hairball it's yeah, it's not yeah. something you'd put on a powerpoint slide and the idea is you can just select one of these things the person mm -hmm. in this case and you'll arrange everything so now everything is organized in these layers so you have for instance all the attributes the mm -hmm. person has and right now because we've selected person they're not you know they're, they're sort of blacked out but mm -hmm. you can uh, and you can see the the other entities that this person type interacts with so company mm -hmm. in this case and then you mm -hmm. can click company and then you can sort of traverse the graph by just clicking on neighbors of neighbors of neighbors of neighbors yeah yeah, that way yeah. you never have to look at the whole hairball as long as you're happy with this local view you can also look at hairball but <laughs> well, I think it's it's there's there's two different use cases for looking at those different views. The hairball is useful to a certain extent in certain situations, whereas I think what you're showing here, and even when you were showing the types and how it was in a hierarchy, mm. fabulous. I mean, so often I hear, I mean, literally just yesterday, I had another 
data scientist, uh, a budding data scientist, reach out to me and he's like, can you please help me? I'm trying to do um, auto classification with my machine learning, but it really doesn't understand hierarchy. And I'm like, yeah, that's right. Like oftentimes that's kind of a lost piece of context, but here you're capturing that. So different types obviously have have a hierarchy. It's a natural hierarchy. Something is a type of something else usually. And then being able to traverse it this way, um, I think is the way people typically think about information. Exactly. Yeah, and, and oh. again, it's that's one of the differentiators. Perhaps the biggest one is this typing system, right? That makes type DB, type DB. <laughs> <laughs> it uh, is what it is. <laughs> and and if we can leverage that in the way that we interact with the database, just in, in for instance, these drop down menus, then we make life so much easier. Yeah. Um, yeah. And again, it makes it much simpler than things like OWL, which have multiple inheritance. So you couldn't possibly have this simple view of your schema. Yeah. You, it would always be a hairball. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, I will say, though, that sometimes multiple inheritance is really helpful. Mm. Um, but I do also acknowledge it makes things highly complex. And sometimes having this poly hierarchy, it's hard to track down. Whereas if you have things structured as a true hierarchy like this, I think you, you, you tend to avoid that. I think we can also look at the data level now because yeah. uh, we've just been looking at the schema. And you can, so some of the work that's in progress is, you know, editing the schema uh, online and just seeing it interactively again, so you don't have to sort of sit and script it. But uh, looking at the data level now, okay, so anyone who's already had a bit of interaction with TypeDB will have probably tried to type out a query, and you can do that here as well. Um, however, one of the things we're building is a low code or no code uh, query builder. That Ooh, is nice. right. So that is some very requested, and I think it's definitely one of the main features here. Yes. Um, but you do have the option, and we could, we'll just have a look here at doing a, a simple uh, matching query, much like you would do in if you're working with TypeDB through the console or through the work base, the native uh, interaction. Uh, uh, app. So here we're just going for an officer, which is a type in this in this schema. And, and what is this? And I remember it used to be called Grackle. What is it called now? The the query uh, language. Yeah, so it's called type QL. At the top here, you can just see an extremely simple query, right? But it's you know it's similar to SQL, and it avoids many of the quite long queries though that you get in SQL and mm -hmm. in in practically any, also in graph query languages for, for Neo4j, uh, for instance, the I think it's still called Cypher. Um, mm -hmm. Cypher. No, very, very cool query language, but I think you're just going to write longer queries in general um, for Neo4j. And it's just, it's probably very much to do with the underlying data representation. It's extremely, I find it extremely easy to learn. Um, oh, good. So we just looked at a really simple example that's very similar to what you would do in, in, in TypeDB's native uh, work base, uh, where you just get, you, you type in a query, or in the future you build it with an interactive menu, but for now you just type it in, and you retrieve these results here, and it, it looks very similar. Now, one of the things we're also doing is making it quite easy to uh, to just look at what your nodes have, what attributes they have. Mm -hmm. TypeDB, type again, has this uh, attribute actually can are also in some way represented as nodes in TypeDB. Mm -hmm. They can play relations, they can have attributes, but, mm -hmm. but it makes sense still to represent attributes. In many cases, attributes are still kind of properties, in, like in yeah. a graph. Yeah. And so, uh, so the choice we've made is in this, in this Still, you can see we just click on one of these nodes and then we've got the attributes in the table. So it's like a property graph. Yeah. But that doesn't prevent you from also visualizing your attributes as nodes. It just means that oh, you sort of just right. So, but that I think that's something that makes sense as a modeling choice. And so you've got your attributes, all, all simple, all as you expect. Now, one of the one of the real things we're trying to to add, which uh, which adds value compared to existing tools, 
It's this idea of exploring the local neighborhood for a node. Uh, because that's something that's often turns out extremely messy because you just get all, you know, in, in a database like this, you'll have some nodes of like a thousand neighbors or two, oh, yeah. two thousand neighbors. So it'll freeze up and, and everything and it'll take a long time. So instead, we have this menu. When you click on a given node, you have a menu and you can see all of the relations that this node can play a role in. Mm -hmm. And then you can just select all of them or you can just go for some of them that you want to expand, very simple. Oh, and it finds only the relevant relations that you asked for, mm. right? That's, that's useful. Another thing that uh, we've tried to do uh, in this app, and this is still, this is something that is computationally demanding, but uh, I think very rewarding for the user, is when you bring up new results in your screen, then it finds the mutual relations between them. So there's an, there's an issue, right, when you just do a query and you get all these nodes, but you don't know how they how they interact. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's uh, one thing you'll you'll see in this example is we bring in some new nodes, but they're not just sort of they're not they're not just isolated. They they have you already get these these relations. So these redder nodes mm -hmm. here are the relations because type B is a hypergraph, right? So these yeah. are the relations and Therefore, that, that just means that you always have this certainty, that's what we're going for, that you see all the relations between what's on your screen. Nice. Yeah, no, and, and that's that's really nice that you don't have to worry about those connections being lost when you're just adding more to, to the graph. Exactly. Yeah, and you don't have to ask for them, right? It'll, it'll tell you. So another thing that you might expect is to be able to edit your data interactively. And you can do that. So we've got this, we're just going to show a very simple example of inserting new data. Mm -hmm. so we're inserting a new entity. It's a, and we're just adding some attributes, uh, mm -hmm. just making some stuff up. And, and now you've got this new, this new entity. And then we're going to add another entity that it can interact with. And again, make some stuff up and and this of course is a a use case where you may not directly want to always sort of build your database you know one data point. Yeah. yeah but you may want to add uh, for instance uh, things like annotations or something as yeah. something within your database so in this case we've just this is just a toy example but the way you could think of it is that you could have this huge database and you could sort of add Nodes which are sort of a different class, like annotations or edits. Yeah, yeah. I actually this this resonates a lot with me actually because I have this happen all the time, and I wish I could do this in a lot of other databases because it's it's those ad hoc relations where we're like, oh man, we just figured out that there was a, a connection that didn't get picked up in our machine learning when we were adding the data. Can we just add it? No, now we have to go back and reload and do do all this other stuff. Whereas if you do it this way, it's an ad hoc quick fix. Um, obviously you're going to want to go and make sure that your machine learning gets fixed <laughs> and know all of that. But if you yeah. need a quick fix or if you need to just add some data incrementally, um, I think this is a really great option. Yeah, it's probably not everyone who will be using it, but I think it, especially looking at it as a way to be able to add metadata potentially, yeah. then you might want to do that. Yeah. But uh, some of the things we're working on uh, a lot is this whole, the schema editing part is is quite advanced already. Uh, and that is, you know, it's also, again, it's the sort of using drop down menus to edit your schema to build it. And then uh, as well, the query building. And there's sort of two options there. There is, I should say, one of them is really just using, again, this sort of drop down menu approach. Mm -hmm. And the other one is having autocomplete. So code completion. Yeah, that would be very helpful. Our timeline that we're just in terms of development is uh, we're working with uh, a couple of kind of early, keen early adopters mm -hmm. to get back. And uh, so that's all that's all kind of closed right now in the sense we're just trying to do this really tight feedback loop mm -hmm. for development. Um, and then we, because again, it kind of makes, it becomes unwieldy uh, if, you, if you bring in too many. So it's really good to have this 
this sort of very focused feedback loop from some people who really, really care about this product, right? Yeah. And really wanted to succeed and for their own for for using it basically for their own for their own ends. Yeah. Um, so that's where the focus is now. This this sort of tight development uh, feedback loop. And then uh, we're looking at more, uh, you know, making much more available and in, including partial open sourcing uh, in uh, next year and uh, beginning of next year.